Welcome to this afternoon's uh, Cases and Careers in Veterinary Medicine. This is Martha Nowak from K-State Olathe. I welcome our guest speaker today, who's gonna address the topic of nanotechnology and nanomaterials in veterinary medicine with applications uh, in a lot of other, other uh, careers. Uh, so Dr. Long, uh, Dr. DeLong, um, welcome, and we're glad to have you. Thank you. Oops, went too far. Okay, can we see the slides full screen? Great. Yeah, so um, today I'd like to talk a little bit about our research and uh, the process we're beginning to translate nanomaterials and nanotechnology into veterinary medicine. We're going to kind of break the talk up into four parts. Uh, first, give a little bit of overview and background, and then talk a little bit about some of the publications that we've produced since moving the lab to K-State. And then towards the end, talk about our approach to translating to veterinary medicine. And as Martha indicated, a couple of the grants that we currently have to apply this to biomedicine. I've had a really interesting career. Uh, it's sort of backwards in a way. I got my PhD from Johns Hopkins, uh, but after a brief postdoc, both of which were supported by the National Institute of Health, I actually went into industry at first. And uh, towards the end of my work in the second company, uh, was working with gold particles and DNA vaccines. And uh, that translated over the next couple of years, I transitioned back to academia and we started out working with gold nanoparticles. Uh, and actually one of the first papers that uh, we published that is now pretty highly cited. I put that up in the upper right hand corner here. Um, talks about kind of the what was known at the time, since there's literally been thousands of papers on gold nanoparticles and their application. But what was known at the time for <clears throat> how gold nanoparticles could deliver DNA or RNA or proteins. And actually that work led to my first patent in the US that occurred uh, in 2013. It was, it was submitted earlier than that. It took a while to get it accepted in the US. And uh, I came to K-State in 2014. Uh, and one of the really interesting things about us coming here is being housed with the lab in the School of Veterinary Medicine, I knew was going to be uh, very key for translating nanotechnology into animals. And um, we have not moved as fast as I would have liked to on that, but we're getting pretty close now. So Zoe asked what, nanotechnology was. And so I figured that was probably going to be the, the case that I needed to do a little bit of background and explain what exactly is a nanoparticle. And um, we live in this sort of world and we take that for granted, but I think the average bear may not really know what that means. So, so actually putting this in, into context with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, actually viruses are nanoparticles. They're, um, when we say something is a nanoparticle or a na nanomaterial, what that actually means is that in one of their dimensions, either their height 
width or um, length, they are in the nano range. That is, they are the one to 200 times 10 to the negative ninth meters, nanometers. And to put that in perspective, I kind of drew the, the ruler, put the ruler next to the virus, or it's, you know, everybody knows about this now, the, the, the protein on the virus called the spike protein that is um, responsible for binding to the receptor and its infectivity. Actually, larger proteins like the spike protein are also in the small nanoscale. And if we put that in the context of the ruler, everybody knows what a ruler is and the smallest increment on that ruler, ruler you know, you can see with the naked eye would be the millimeter or maybe a tenth of a millimeter you could make out on the ruler. And so nanotechnology is about 10,000 times smaller than that. 10,000 times. In another perspective, people, um, students, um, investigators, scientists often know what a microscope is. A microscope can visualize a cell. And we have many, many types of different cells in, in our bodies and in animals' bodies. And when we talk about the microscope, that is in the micro range cells are typically 10 microns that is in the 10 to the negative six meters um and so we are uh at least a thousand times smaller than the micro scale so so nanoparticles are smaller than cells by about a thousand times roughly and so that puts more of a biological or viral virological spin on what nanotechnology is and the scale of nanotechnology, the nanoscale. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna start getting into the research, but I just wondered, is there any question about what nanomaterials are at this point? Is everybody, everybody kind of with me? Okay. So this is a busy slide. Suffice it to say, all I want to show here is that nanomaterials come in many shapes and sizes and even flavors, if you will. They can be made out of essentially, in theoretically, any element within the periodic chart can be fabricated into a nanomaterial. Yes? What we often use, um, we often will categorize nanomaterials as, um, for example, here on the right-hand side, gold AU nanoclusters. So this would be categorized as an inorganic nanomaterial. Um, many elements within the periodic chart would go in this category, if you will. So tiny, tiny atoms clustered together um, to make a nanomaterial out of an element, let's say, okay? And then here on the left-hand side, oftentimes um, we can do chemistry essentially almost out of um, plastic materials, polymers, and we can synthesize nanomaterials into shapes. We can, and for example, this is one of our publications where my synthetic collaborator um, synthesized a nanowire and what's kind of neat is these bright lights off of the nanowire are actually antibodies, um, proteins that recognize specific reagents. And so nanomaterials have very unusual and unique properties. And, and so for example, in this nanowire, what we did is we, it's essentially a circuit. We, we followed the current across this nanowire, okay? And that current, when it binds a protein like bovine serum albumin or human serum albumin, there's a shift in the current. And so it's a very, very sensitive way to detect a protein binding, if that makes sense. But really what I just wanted to show here is that essentially nanomaterials have and, and will continue to be made out of all kinds of different materials and shapes and sizes. And, one of their applications, certainly, and probably the first application um, you know, that we will see make it to um, 
full scale um, biomedical or clinical applications will be the use of nanomaterials for diagnostic assay purposes. That makes sense. Imagine this nanowire, for example, were functionalized. Can you see my cursor? Were functionalized, for example, with an antibody against COVID-19, then maybe we could detect the virus binding onto the nanowire by changes in microcircuitry, if that makes sense. In this case, what we were detecting, we were essentially using an RNA antibody called an aptamer, um, which interacts with the gold, but that aptamer is kind of like an RNA antibody and it recognizes a protein called thrombin, which is really important in our bloodstream. It can be an indicator, for example, of stroke or a heart attack. And so we, by binding thrombin to the surface of the aptamer, the, size of the nanoparticle changes. And so the size would shift from 12.7 nanometers, for example, when bound with the thrombin out to larger and larger sizes, the more and more thrombin protein were bound around the surface. And so the size shift can also be an indicator of how much thrombin protein somebody has in their bloodstream, if that makes sense. So this is a more of a diagnostic type application of nanomaterials. Now, our general approach to translation, somewhat born out of my experience in biopharma early on, and actually this is one of the great reasons why I came to K-State, is I wanted to sort of run the full gamut of what we need to do to, to bring nanomedicines into animals and to test their safety and efficacy in animals. Okay, this, when you're in biopharma, the end result before a clinical trial is that you need to demonstrate safety and efficacy in preclinical trials within animals. Okay, and so what this shows is our strategy. So I wanted to run on the full gamut between synthesizing nanoparticles out of lots of different elements. I didn't want to restrict myself to gold. Gold is not natural in the body. I mean, we do wear it on our jewelry, but you know, do we want to have a, a, a lot of gold in our bodies? Maybe for a vaccine, it's okay when we only administer it for a couple of times, but likely we want these nanomaterials to be made out of physiological elements that we already have in our bodies, if that makes sense. Then what I wanted to be able to do is to set up my lab so that not only could we make and synthesize nanoparticles, but being trained as a biochemist and a biophysicist myself, excuse me, I was really interested in the interaction. How do we get drugs? How do we get proteins and RNA, DNA on the surface of particles in a controlled way? And how can we study that? And then once we know what we actually have in terms of the nanomaterial or nanoparticle drug complex or conjugate, then we need to be able to, for example, in the cancer type applications, study their effects on cancer cells. And over the years, we've learned, for example, with different cancer models that maybe, uh, stu well, studies in cell culture, I'm sorry, studies in cell culture can be somewhat informative. If we kind of want to understand more about how these materials affect the tumor, then we have to be able to essentially grow artificial tumors. And so one of the things the lab has also been involved in is what's called tumor spheroid modeling. Um, we kind of grow these little artificial tumors in the lab. Ah, I'm sorry. And we study the effect of the nanoparticles on them. And then ultimately, when we have some anti-tumor activity, then we are going to want to go into mouse models and eventually into dog models and try to help dogs that have cancer. And so that's kind of our translation strategy overall. Okay, so as I said, nanomaterials can be made out of practically any element. And I think, except maybe some of these you know, elements down here that are hard to come by. I think they already have, as far as I can tell, most of the elements have been covered. 
But because we want to do nanomedicine, because we want to put these nanoparticles into animals and eventually humans, I've really focused on the metals more recently besides gold and besides silver. There's a ton of work done on gold and silver nanoparticles, and there are some great applications for that, particularly for diagnostics. But if we want to put these in, 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 in the, in the animal's body and the human body, then we've got to focus on the metals that the body knows how to deal with. And more importantly, we, we were talking about zinc, for example, earlier on before this seminar started. You know, in our bodies, in cells and tissues, actually zinc and a little bit of magnesium and, and sometimes iron, some of these other elements, those are the things that proteins and RNA naturally bind anyway. So, I thought maybe we should start working on some of these physiologically, um, physiological metal types of nanoparticles. And so we initially focused a lot on the zinc chemistry, um, but now we are branching out um, into some of these other types of metal nanoparticles. And in fact, you can even make materials that actually don't exist in nature. You can make nanomaterials that have more than one, two, three, even four elements in the nanomaterial. And that imparts um, very unique properties on the material. How do we know we actually have synthesized a nanomaterial? Well, we, we often will get the pretty picture. That is, we'll use the electron microscope to uh, directly visualize what the nanoparticle in, looks like. And, the shape and and um, in that case we um, are looking down in the nano range essentially you're bombarding the nanoparticle with electrons and the pattern that develops is an image of the nanoparticle itself and we know um, in a couple of weeks at k-state we're going to host a professor from the university of toronto who who basically did the key publication to show that um, when you put nanomaterials in the body in the circulation, you want, I don't know if I can get my cursor here, you want to have things in more of this sort of nano um, cube, nano rod type shape here. And we were successful in being able to synthesize um, these physiologically based metal nanoparticles in that shape for eventual in vivo trials. Maybe I should stop here because we're going to get more and more complicated. Um, have I lost anybody so far? Is everybody with me? Yes? Okay. Nothing in the chat box, so <laughs> keep going. I can't see that. I should be able to. I, you'll tell me, I guess, if there if there is, right? Okay. Will do. Thank, thank you. Okay, so... Imagine that a drug, if you can see my hand, my fist is the nanoparticle. Imagine that a drug or an RNA vaccine or some biomedically interesting material interacts or conjugates to the nanoparticle, okay? So if that's the case, how do you study that? More importantly, if we're gonna be putting this into animals' bodies, into humans' bodies, we have to be able to quantify that. Yes. So I worked one of the first, uh, the second year I came to K-State, I worked with a company called Molecular Devices Corp out in California to develop an assay where we could quantify so-called nanobio interaction, a drug or an RNA or protein interacts with the surface of a nanoparticle. Where is my cursor? Here it is. Okay. So we could interact all kinds of things with the surface. This shows gold, but this could be iron. It could be zinc oxide. It could be any, could be a polymer for that matter. And what interacts with the surface of this and how do we, well, how we study that, it turns out many nanoparticles, again, because of the uni unique physical chemical nature of these materials, they are fluorescent. And so if we shine a specific wavelength of light or frequency of light onto this nanoparticle, they will give off another wavelength of fluorescent light, if that makes sense. And so what we did, this actually was our second patent now. Um, what we did is, the, if you look at the fluorescent pattern, you know, 
much of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's dark, okay? But there is a nanoparticle specific hot spot, if you will. At that wavelength and at that frequency of light, the nanoparticle accepts that light and fluoresces. And of course, when you put a molecule of interest on the surface of the nanoparticle, what do you think is gonna to happen to the light that comes off? That light is gonna absorb and be a function of the, of the material that's on the surface of the nanoparticle. And so you can use that, what we call two-dimensional fluorescence difference to quantify um, nanobio interaction at the surface of a nanoparticle. And so, like I said, in addition to synthesizing different types of nanoparticles, we are interested in characterizing their interactions with different materials at the surface. And this is just one that we got patented and published type of a assay for that, quantifying that. Okay, so suffice it to say that, I should go back. Um, the easiest way for us to synthesize pure biometal nanoparticles was essentially, if you can see my little right-hand corner up here, essentially to stick it in an instrument that would have a laser that would bombard uh, the thin film of material and thus um, atomize that material and in the process essentially collect nanoparticle powders. This is a, it's a small scale method. You, you could never make enough material to dose an animal with this, but it's a beautiful way to make pure nanoparticles. And so our first kind of for, foray into that was to, okay, let's make those nanoparticles and let's, um, let me go forward just a little bit, okay. Let us um, take some cancer cells. I'll go back to the translation strategy here. Let's take some cancer cells, grow them in culture. And with a little bit of that nano powder, we'll salt and pepper them onto these cells. Okay, just like it's a salt and pepper shaker. That isn't exactly how we did an experiment. <laughs> you have to have the nanoparticles in suspension, but we incubated the nanoparticles with cancer cells. And in my lab, we were pretty good at growing melanoma skin cancer cells. So we, we tried it with melanoma first, okay? And amazingly, um, the, in the initial series we tested was here, there was a very clear um, anti-cancer activity for zinc oxide. Now, what was really comforting is around that time, Three or four other labs in the world also showed that zinc oxide had anti-cancer activity, which is always good when that happens. So um, the, in this one paper that we published in 2017, we even pushed that a little bit further. We actually took the melanoma cells and gave it to a syngenetic mouse and grew tumors and injected the tumor with zinc oxide. And indeed those tumors did shrink. I'm, sh I'm not showing, there's a whole bunch of data in this paper. It was a four year project, but um, that's the upshot that basically in cell culture and in a tumor model, um, mouse model, the zinc oxide. So now people believe, and I'm gonna go back, that zinc oxide um, is essentially a chemotherapeutic nanoparticle, if that makes sense. It acts like a chemotherapeutic nanoscale drug. And the question was why? And so we spent a couple of years trying to figure that out, as did other labs around the world. And it turns out, interestingly enough, zinc oxide has probably four mechanisms that are anti-cancer mechanisms. One is that when zinc oxide is in water, essentially these positively charged hydrates form. What's really interesting about cancer cells is that their membrane is more negative than normal cells, okay? So what that means is that zinc oxide is attracted to cancer cells maybe a little bit more than it would be a normal cell. It's just positive, negative opposites attract. That's pretty easy. But then as it turns out, um, within cancer cells and with, certainly within tumors, often these tumors are a little bit acidic. 
cancer cell is too. It's metabolizing too fast. It's turning over acidic products and I can't get, can't deal with it as fast as a normal cell might because it's going too fast. And so um, essentially when zinc oxide gets into the cell because of this tumor pH gradient, more of the zinc oxide, more of the zinc gets digested. And so the cell gets swamped with zinc and zinc is good for cells, but having too much is bad. Okay, and so that also has an anti-cancer effect. And the other thing our group has studied a lot is um, the effect of zinc oxide on enzymes. For example, thrombin that I talked about earlier on is one enzyme, um, but there are a number of enzymes in cancer cells and the cancer cells metabolize faster, okay? And so these enzymes are more active. And if the enzyme is, if the enzyme or enzymes is inhibited by zinc oxide, this is another mechanism by which the zinc oxide is killing cancer cells, if that makes sense. And one of the big, for the fourth aspect here, so-called reactive oxygen species, zinc is not the most ROS generating material, but it does generate ROS, reactive oxygen species. And when reactive oxygen species are released in cancer cells, they go around and they oxidize biomolecules that would normally make the cancer cell um, metabolic and active. And when um, in this oxidative state, the cancer cells essentially go through a program of cell death. It's, it's a process in cells called apoptosis. And actually for cancer cells, that's what you want. You wanna to try to get them to tip them over into program cell death. And so these are the mechanisms uh, that by which zinc oxide is now thought to be a chemotherapeutic or anti-cancer nanoparticle. Okay, and we published a, a really nice review article two years ago in the Journal of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics where we talked about this mechanism and how we might exploit that and translate into higher animals. Um, that's a special edition of that journal focused on translating nanomedicine. And that, all my references are at the end, but if this is being recorded, if you wanna go back and find this article, they're in the upper right-hand corner often. Okay. Now we're starting to get really technical. So far, is everybody following me? So far, so good? Okay, awesome. All right, and so this I'm happy to say is my last graduate student's coup de gras. This is a paper that she just got published in PLOS one just before the end of the year. So, you know, zinc oxide has these general anti-cancer mechanisms and that's fine. But how can we make zinc oxide a more targeted nanomedicine, if that makes sense? I'm gonna move my screen over. So let's, let's go here to the inside of this. For example, this is an inside of a melanoma cell. Do you see this? Many times, um, some of the best cancer drugs we have now are targeting uh, what we call receptor tyrosine kinases. They target the surface receptors on these cancer cells, okay? We know zinc oxide gets into cancer cells. That much we know. So why can't we use zinc oxide to carry into that cancer cell a protein that would essentially gum up the works of this cell? Where's my cursor? So what we did, um, Potentially one of the more important oncogenes or onco um, cancer promoting proteins, oncogenes are the gene and then the gene gets expressed into a protein has sort of been the holy grail of cancer medicine called RAS, okay? Many times uh, cancers, particularly the more devastating ones that are hard to treat, have an activated RAS pathway and or mutations in RAS itself of which there are three major kinds, NRAS, KRAS, and HRAS, depending on the type of cancer it is. And if I can find my cursor again, here it is. <laughs> or an even more subtle thing happens is that the proteins and enzymes that are downstream of RAS, the cancer cell figures out a way to activate those proteins, okay? But what if, we certainly know that zinc oxide binds protein. I'll, I'll show you a couple of assays how we know that in a sec. But, and we certainly know that zinc oxide gets into cells. So how about we deliver into the cancer cell 
a zinc oxide complex with RAS binding domain protein. We're gonna take RAS directly out of the equation by gumming it up with a nanoparticle delivered protein, okay? And I just, I love this idea and it, it really worked pretty well actually. So um, if we go back to, to our kind of, this is maybe a little bit easier to see so here, for example, is the fluorescence, like we talked about, of zinc oxide, okay? We're gonna shine um, a fluorescent wavelength of light on, light on the zinc oxide, shoot, I'm sorry. And um, it's gonna give off, it's gonna emit, it's gonna have an emission wavelength of light, yes? And what you can see is when the RBD binds on the protein, that light gets quenched, it goes down. The, the, the light can't come off of the protein bound nanoparticle. And what's neat is, as I was alluding to earlier, this is a way that we can quantify how much the protein is bound on the zinc oxide. We can also, uh, Zoe, I don't know if you've ever run a protein gel yet in your, in your labs in, in high school, have you? Okay, we, we do this technique called gel electrophoresis and we kind of, you know what jello is and we, we we essentially make a jello pattern and we put proteins on there and they run down through the gel and then we stain them and so individual protein like rbd will give a band on that pattern so how do we know the zinc oxide has rbd bound up bound up well we take zinc oxide you know and we wash the rbd off of the zinc oxide and my goodness there it is in the gel so we, we have pretty good confidence that we have, and we kind of know how much is on the zinc oxide. And so when we give that to cancer cells, we were talking about apoptosis. If we use a stain that stains for apoptosis, this is a classic apoptosis pattern here where the cancer cells are looking like they're kind of dying. Um, and indeed, when the zinc oxide is bound to RBD, zinc oxide will kill cancer cells. Yes, indeed, but you gotta go to pretty high concentrations when you know you only need a 20 microgram per mil dose and most of the cancer cells are dead when they're bound to RBD. So we think this is a way to maybe target, um, make the zinc oxide a more targeted nanomedicine if, that's, if that makes sense. The idea that it would bring in, for example, a protein like RAS binding domain, which would bind this RAS and it would not allow the cancer cell to go through this pattern that, that it needs to do to grow and divide rapidly. Any questions so far? Okay. So now let's start talking about, you know, maybe where we can start impacting animal health with these nanomaterials in the, more of a near-term sort of vaccination type approach. I think we're still a little ways away from being able to deliver proteins like RBD onto the, on the zinc oxide. We're gonna to have to work out some chemistry for that still. But maybe a near-term solution would be to um, a vaccine type approach. And so how can we tap into that? So one of the things we did early on with gold, gold does not naturally, unlike zinc oxide, gold does not naturally interact with RNA or protein. And so we have to kind of induce it to do that. So we can, we can put this protein called protamine on there, which is um, naturally in our bodies and likes to bind um, nucleic acids or DNA. And so we can then give the gold nanoparticle, which would normally be negatively charged a positively charged surface. And then that's a great way that we can load a lot of DNA vaccine onto the surface of the nanoparticle. Nice thing about that is that protamine is already actually in vaccine formulations. And so that's an approved way to actually deliver vaccine into animals and into humans. And when we do that, I won't go into this too much, but there, um, for example, a lot of people will use a DNA vaccine against hepatitis B. That's a common research reagent now. And so, when we load the DNA vaccine that encodes hepatitis B surface antigen, SAG, or core antigen, these are viral antigens, viral proteins, but we load the DNA for that it co encodes those viral proteins. And we give that to, in this case, I think it was guinea pigs. When we give that 
there's a, um, a really good boost of titer. That is that we have antibodies against the hepatitis B surface antigen, the hepatitis B core antigen. So now we're kind of exploiting this approach, but maybe we wanna be able to give um, more than one boost, or maybe we would like to create essentially a therapeutic vaccine. And so we need, we need the nanoparticle to do more than simply carry the DNA vaccine, if that makes sense. We need it to deliver, okay? So one of the issues, you know, as we probably know, um, RNA vaccines have really hit the big time because they were the first off the shelf, off the market for COVID-19. I've always been a big believer in big RNA vaccines. Basically, my, uh, I'm glad that people finally realized that, you know, this is the way to go. And so the problem with RNA vaccines is that traditionally, um, RNA is the least stable biomolecule. The minute it hits the body, it gets degraded. So any nanoparticle worth its salt has basically got to be able to stabilize the RNA. And so this is a nice paper that actually one of my vet um, students worked in the lab um, and we published in, I think it was 2017, showing that, that when, for example, um, if we complex RNA to zinc oxide and we give it, uh, we take a tumor and we, we mince it up and we make a tumor homogenate, which would ordinarily be chock full of enzymes that would kill RNA. By God, that RNA band, th this is a RNA gel, not a protein gel. And what we're looking at is the full length RNA that's stained in this RNA gel. You can see in the presence of the zinc oxide, it remains active. And so we think zinc oxide is gonna be a tremendous way to deliver RNA vaccine. Maybe even in other, um, models besides melanoma, for example. The other thing that's interesting is that gold gives you essentially very little immunological activity. It's a great carrier and it's pretty inert, um, but it, right, if we wanna have a uh, vaccine effect, then we've gotta be able to activate the immune system. Normally vaccines do that with aluminum sometimes. There's a little bit of aluminum in there, believe there, this is, what's called adjuvants that are added to vaccines to amplify the immune response at the site of injection. And so interestingly enough, myself and many, many others in the world have been interested in what happens with nanoparticles to the immune system. And so this is a great article that we, we actually just surveyed the literature a few years ago to see um, of the main types of nanoparticles. Oh, for example, silica nanoparticles are often used and iron oxide nanoparticles are often used. In the literature, it, was there evidence of immunological activation when these nanoparticles um, were given? And this was mostly actually at the time. Now, um, this kind of stuff is coming out in animals, but at the time it was done in cell culture with cells of the immune system like macrophages or natural killer cells or T cells. So, any cell that elicited an immune response, we, we used in this literature metadata analysis. And what was very clear, once again, was that zinc oxide is a immune activating material. Oftentimes you wanna have effects, for example, on interleukin-2, because that's an indicator that you're gonna have an antibody response, or um, some of these other cytokines. These are essentially, um, proteins that are secreted or produced by our immune cells that activate the immune response, if that makes sense. And so nanomaterials do do that. And so, for example, by loading RNA vaccine, maybe onto zinc oxide, yes, the RNA will express the antigen, but the nanoparticle will also activate the immune system and the RNA vaccine will ultimately end up being more active, if that makes sense. Okay, so we're coming to the end of what I have prepared. I thought maybe there might be more questions um, during, the, during the talk. How are we doing for time here? Good? We've still got 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes, perfect. So as it turns out, um, we last two years have gotten two small grants that are sort of biomedical applications of nanomaterials that I thought um, would be interesting to show. And this is 
we actually do not <laughs> we do not have publications yet on on this so i'm not going to actually show any data per se but i'm going to show you kind of what we're working on and how we apply this and i'm pretty excited by both these grants um so when the covid 19 pandemic hit the nsf or national science foundation put out a call for what they call rapid proposals that were um, people's best ideas for how to limit um you know to how to respond to the pandemic and so I didn't get into this one paper, but we we basically knew from a previous uh, publication I didn't show today for lack of time that copper nanoparticles degrade and denature proteins and RNA. And of course, the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, but as we talked about, it has the spike protein on its surface also shown here. So can you imagine uh, when the coronavirus with its spike protein and RNA in the inside hits a surface that contains a copper nanoparticle, what's going to happen is that the protein is going to denature and degrade. And what's kind of neat is that in the market, there already is examples of copper-based products. I think that the famous one is the Brett Favre, um, the former quarterback that uses the copper sleeve that is infused with copper. So there already exist in the market examples of copper-based products. And so we thought, why don't we try to come up with a method to coat the surface of face masks is what we tried at first, but you know, it could potentially go to other personal protective equipment, PPE, you know, shields and things. But we thought it was easier to get the copper nanoparticle, for example, on the surface of a face mask. And so we've, um, I'm not gonna get a chance to talk about this, but we've developed three methods that we can put copper nanoparticles on the face masks. And we are now actually in the throes of doing experiments to see what happens, for example, um, when nanoparticles are, when the copper nanoparticles are coated onto these materials and proteins and RNA, um, hit these surfaces and not to let the cat out of the bag, but what happens is what we thought is gonna happen. That is, we are getting some protein and RNA denaturation, but those are very preliminary results and we, we haven't quite published that yet. But this was a grant funded by NSF um, and actually excited to say that we've discovered some newer types of nanomaterials that inhibit the virus as well. And so, um, I anticipate that we might write another grant on that as well. Okay. And then the other uh, pilot grant that we got, and this is a collaboration with the University of Missouri actually, was to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, there is a protein enzyme discovered in the last five or six years or so called CRISPR-Cas9. This is the classic one, but there are other types of these enzymes. And what they can do is essentially gene edit. In theory, uh, the enzyme would be able to replace a um, portion of the genome when where there is a mutation and, the, and correct it, so-called gene editing. Um, so, one of the classic diseases uh, that has a genetic basis where it is very well understood what that is, is cystic fibrosis. And so not to get into this too much, but one of the most common mutations uh, the University of Missouri group has now built a reporter system so that when the CRISPR-Cas9 corrects the gene mutation in that area, what will end up happening is that we will turn those cells green. Um, maybe people have heard of the green fluorescent protein. There are various permutations of this used in biotechnology. And what's even neater, they've created essentially a transgenic mouse now 
uh, where we can use that as an in vivo model uh, for CRISPR-Cas9 activity. And to the best of my knowledge, no one has yet reported a nanoparticle that is capable of um, essentially doing what it's designed to do that is correct a mutation that is relevant to a, a in fact, the NIH last year had a call for proposals to um, develop animal model systems. And so, of course, what my lab has done is figured out right now if this works in a test tube. And I'm excited to say it does, actually. There are nanoparticle compositions, not necessarily gold. Um, there, you know, for example, Vince Rotello's group did this with gold, but he didn't do it to this system. And so I'm happy to say that we actually have identified a nanoparticle composition that will allow the CRISPR-Cas9 to be functional and correct that mutation. And now we want to translate that into the reporter model. If that works, then we're well on our way to translating that um, clinically. And that would be a subsequent grant, I would think. We're just starting to talk about that now. Okay, so just as a really high level summary, I've showed a lot of different types of data and experiments today. Basically the lab has, is um, kind of maybe even unique in the world in the sense that we have gotten very good at, dis, at studying interactions between nanoparticles and proteins and RNA. Um, but we don't do that, you know, fundamentally, we're interested in applying that knowledge um, as an anti-cancer or an antiviral approach, if that makes sense. And right now we have two smaller grants um, to look at this for gene editing in the case of CRISPR-Cas9 and to look at the effect of this on the coronavirus protein and RNA. Um, and I'm very, very interested of course in nanoparticle delivery of RNA vaccine and what we can do in terms of the binding and the stabilization and the delivery of RNA vaccines with different nanoparticle compositions. And that's work that's ongoing right now. Um, and I'm happy to say we have just submitted another patent on that as well. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I actually, um, we do do a little bit of nanoparticle synthesis in my lab, as I said, but I am often dependent on our collaborators that are more synthetic, chem, better synthetic chemists than myself um, to give us the nanoparticle compositions, at least at first. And also I wanna thank um, Dr. Clark at the University of Missouri for his helping. And he's the PI on the CF Foundation grant. And he's with the collaborators there responsible for developing the animal model that we're doing the testing in. And I've got a whole bunch of tremendous collaborators at K-State, even one that's at K-State Olathe and Dr. Dr. Jabari. So he's a big data collaborator. And I've had a great number of students over the years. These are all the students at K-State, I think. Um, and actually the students, I've only talked about the former students in the lab and um, they're, the ones that are in white are the people's data that I showed today and they've, been very successful. My last PhD students now at UMass and my Miranda Hurst is at Johns Hopkins and they've been integrating the students into this research has had a really great benefit on their on their career. And in addition to NIH and NSF, as I said, when I first transitioned out of academia, I was lucky enough to get a um, visiting summer research fellowship from HHMI and that kind of launched my research career and I got my first faculty position and we've also had a little bit of funding from the American Physiology Society that I didn't get a chance to talk about today. And here's our references and now I'm ready to take questions if there are any. Well I was taking notes but Zoe I'm going to let you have first go at this. If you have any questions at all to ask uh, Dr. DeLong, um, I'll, I'll give you first first go. I actually, I don't really have questions. I kind of got a lot of what you were talking about. So. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Future researcher right there from Olathe North, I think, isn't it? That's awesome. Sure. 
Well, if you don't have one, Zoe, I have more of a general research question. Um, you said you were in biopharma and I'm looking at how they, how competitive they were developed to develop the COVID vaccine. Yes. Um, or a vaccine. And now we have three, I think, approved right now or on the emergency use, not FDA approved, but emergency use. Right. Um, so I, you know, as, as a, you know, if, if I were a potential researcher coming through high school, if I were a high school student, I loved all this research stuff. Um, I wondered how, if you could explain, and you did a little bit with the NSF grant and saying, you know, I really can't reveal this uh, because it hadn't been published and so forth. Um, how does intellectual property come into play um, with any developing any new technology? How is that handled? Mm -hmm. um, it, okay, so in my previous companies, we did um, submit patents too. And often um, in smaller companies, they're going to need to um, either be acquired by, the, by a larger company to fully develop the technology or um, undergo a, a research or licensing agreement. Um, at K-State, that is certainly true too. That is if, if uh, once we uh, file for a patent and it gets awarded, the, the patent I showed in 2018, I've never seen something get patented in it, you know, actually so fast. It's usually it takes a couple of years for that process to happen. Um, but it was very fast in that case. And we have had um, uh, put agreements in place with companies interested in that patent. But in the case of the COVID um, patent, absolutely, they're going to move um, to that rapidly. And, you know, the process would then be a company would then license that technology from K-State. When I was working in companies, if you had a patent, then the company owns the right to that patent and the company to company interaction. In this case, it would be a company to industry or an industry to academia or university type arrangement. Yep. I don't know if that answered your question. It does. It's it's a it's a sticky wicket. Um, you have to have those memorandums of understanding. You know, yes. You, you have to within your team. I mean, your research team that is working so closely together. There has to be a great level of understanding. You have to have a very clear PI uh, who's in charge, whose name is going to go first on that that research paper and so forth. Um, but I just. It's just interesting as we have high school culture is so much to share. There is yes. so much of, uh, an interest in the social aspect. I just wonder the impact of, of uh, our present generation coming into uh, research. I wonder how that will be handled. So I wish I had a little crystal ball and could look into. No, that's a really good question. Yep. I, I mean, I clearly had to, you know, run my presentation by the university before I gave it. In fact, I had to give an earlier version of this to, to a conference that's already been recorded and stuff. And so, yep. And that's even worse in companies that I could hardly ever, when I worked in industry, I could hardly ever give a talk or, you know, because they were just so secretive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, recommendation you could give Dr. DeLong to high schoolers that are coming up uh, through various signature programs or through uh, biochemistry? Any um, recommendations you could make to them as uh, looking back on your career path and, and your academ academic path, uh, any, any uh, jewels of, of wisdom you could send our way? Yeah, I mean, I've published with one high school student already um, a couple of summer ago, summers ago, she visited in the lab. And I'm working with another high school student in Kansas City right now on a project. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, we couldn't get him here, um, unfortunately, but we are doing something virtual. But I absolutely am a huge believer in 
students reaching, even high school students reaching out to college professors who are interested in starting to have that dialogue. Um, you can do research, even if it's only literature research, you can understand a lot about research even before you matriculate into college. And if I had my say, every student that goes to college should be involved in some level of undergraduate research. Um, there's just so many you know, benefits of that. They learn to think deeper, they're more disciplined, they you know, apply their knowledge in science and math and engineering in a better way. I mean, there's just so many benefits. So, but you don't have to wait till you're in college. You can start that conversation with a professor before. So Zoe, is there an aspect of animal health in which you are very, very interested? Um, not really at the moment. I'm trying to, I'm waiting for my senior year to see if that's kind of some, we're doing a zoology class senior year. That's what mm -hmm. I'm looking for. Um, so not really, nothing right now particularly. Let's, uh, what we can do, we can kind of, you know, we can do the thing, what am I not interested in? So <laughs> you want to work with, you want to work with animals or, or do you want to work with cells or do you want to work with molecules or nanomaterials or, you know, where in that box? I mean, I hate putting myself in a box, so, you know, but just tell me of those four things, what, what do you like most right now? Animals mostly. Okay. But this was pretty interesting, so to keep that going. It's interesting. I mean, you know, at K-State, we have professors that are doing all kinds of different things with animals, you know, animal behavior. Um, um, oh, I should be able to roll these off the tip of my tongue. So, you know, everything from, you know, just gross animal studies to me down here in nanotechnology, trying to get them into animals, everything in between, you know. Even animals as biosensors. I mean, there are, there are some dogs that can smell cancer cells. Oh yeah. Or isn't that fascinating? Detected by you know the owners get to say you know my dog seems awfully attentive. I wonder if my cancer has gone active again, and they go to oh. the doctor and find. Isn't out. that fascinating? I know. Yeah. So you know there that human animal bond can't be underestimated. Um, they they usually know before we do. So. Uh, if you're really, really interested in animals, that's that's great, uh, Zoe. Uh, don't uh, don't overlook the chance to compete uh, in November for our One Health Day um, competition. Uh, this past year, it was strictly uh, a literature review, but maybe with a connection with Dr. DeLong, <laughs> we could make something happen like that, uh, where you could say, I've, I've done this type of research, what do you think? Um, and and uh, see, they offer scholarships to, to, to do that um, through BioNexus. They make it available. So um, now look forward to that, the One Health. Uh, and that has quite a few careers that could possibly be involved. I mean, health, and it could Absolutely. be as people, the environment, you could work for the EPA. You know, there are all kinds of um, ways to look at a healthy uh, a healthy you because there are lots of aspects that um, interact that make you a healthy you, <laughs> whether it's the animals around you, the, the environment, the, the water, the soil, the air, all kinds of things. And this, this whole nanoparticle thing is, um, is amazing. We, uh, we just, with a collaborator in India, we just published a paper on, on that, how you apply nano, nano materials to environmental sensing um, and, um, you know, crop health and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's something that has tremendous potential. I'm just waiting to find the right collaborator here that can, you know, take us in that direction. Ah, I'm thinking ag. Okay. I wrote yes. nanoparticles and ag. Um, oh, ag that's got tremendous potential. Right, because they've got a lot of sensitive. It's like the dog's nose. I mean, there's there's a tremendous amount of sensitivity. It's just how do you deploy them, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Sky's the limit. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks. Zoe, you have any other questions? I took up too much time. I'm, I'm really supposed to let you guys uh, be in the forefront, but I've really enjoyed this conversation with, with both of you.